right? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. So basically, I'll be focusing on hypothyroidism. And uh, majorly, we talk about primary and secondary hypothyroidism. Extremely common. In India, the prevalence is higher as compared to the United Kingdom or the USA. You can see the difference between the coastal cities and Indian inland cities, um, the prevalence rates. And this was um, an article which was published in the Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology that hypothyroidism in India, there's a lot to be done. So remember that before 1880, we had nothing. So all patients with hypothyroidism diagnosed before 1880, um, the mortality was 100%. From 1880 to 1970, we had desiccated thyroid extract, which was a crude mixture of T4 and T3. So I'll be coming back to this a little later. So since 1970 only, that we have the first branded levothyroxine and we all know that is T4. I, um, this is my favorite slide, just to show you. So the father has hypothyroidism. Uh, this is a type 1 diabetic and he or she also has hypothyroidism. So we have two two. Uh, members in the family with hypothyroidism and one with type 1 diabetes. So uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, the, it does not uh, run in families. Type 2 does. The concordance rate is uh, much higher. But concordance rate, uh, I've explained already. Now, when we talk of familial hypothyroidism, you can see two members of the family having primary hypothyroidism. So um, what happened was that the mother went into the kitchen. Uh, she was cooking. She caught fire. She died. The father stopped his thyroid medication. He went into myxedema coma. He died. And the three children were subsequently orphans. And they're now being looked after their grandparents. I'm talking of about almost uh, a quarter of a century back. So now they're lost to follow up. Just to highlight the importance of lifelong medication for hypothyroidism, I know uh, all of you will have the, had this experience that despite counseling, patients still discontinue their medications quite often. And then the end result can be very tragic, like in this case study, which I have shown you. I'll start off with adult hypothyroidism. I'm not going into the symptoms and signs. Everybody is familiar with them. But it is important to know that many patients with hypothyroidism report no symptoms. The diagnostic accuracy of symptoms and signs, which are nonspecific, occasionally quite insensitive. So the symptoms will be related to the duration, severity, and the rapidity with which hypothyroidism develops. And if the patient has new or persistent symptoms which are occurring in combination, it is more likely to be relevant. Again, a host of laboratory radiological invest findings as well. Now coming to the case. She's 46 years old. She has gained 20 kilograms of weight. She has features which are typical of hypothyroidism on exam as well as uh, in the history. She also has bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, delayed relaxation, all features which are typical of hypothyroidism, which is corroborated by this very high TSH. So undoubtedly, she's a case of primary autoimmune hypothyroidism. She was started on levothyroxine 100 micrograms and her biochemically she was normal and she was now euthyroid. The question that I want to address is the complaint or the weight record, she had gained 20 kilograms of weight gain. So what about that? What will happen to that? So taking the other case and then both of I will tell you what I, I want, what the message I want to convey. So another lady who has swelling, weight gain, 10 kilograms in the last one year with aches and pains, 
and she is absolutely euthyroid as you can see from her thyroid profile so the message that i want to convey here the 20 kilograms there and the 10 kilograms are not because of hypothyroidism please remember obesity exists without hypothyroidism obesity can mimic most symptoms of hypothyroidism and obese people lifelong they attribute their symptoms to hypothyroidism if ever by chance that TSH is marginally elevated. So hypothyroidism does not cause morbid obesity and weight gain even in severe hypothyroidism is less than 5 kilograms. So that, that weight loss they have to achieve on their own however they may do so. So this algorithm is very familiar to all of us. Again, I'm not going to go into details let alone to show you that at one point in time when the diagnosis is not clear, then an endocrinology consultation is warranted. In the elderly, the symptoms and lab data are utterly confusing. And you can see that the, the different symptoms at the above 70 or less than 55, that the totally uh, different manifestations in the elderly they have decreased T4 clearance, which is likely related to the decreased lean body mass and leads to decreased T4 production rate. So older or the elderly persons may require a lower T4 dose to treat hypothyroidism. And you can see changes in the mean T4 dose with advancing age from 40 up to over 60 plus. And if you look at the percentiles, you can see that as age advances, so does the TSH. And we, we know where we are with the up to 60, even maybe 85. But beyond 85, we really do not know what the TSH levels should be maintained. But just to give you the take home message here, in the elderly, we will not treat subclinical hypothyroidism until the uh, antibodies are strongly positive or if the patient has dyslipidemia. So there's markers uh, which we will look into before deciding to treat. So subclinical hypothyroidism in the elderly, no, because I said TSH advances with age. And some of that is also protective. It says that um, a longer life may be associated with a higher TSH. Okay, so your patient has normal TSH. I gave you an example, but persistent symptoms of hypothyroidism, genuinely. So these are the causes that I have listed here. A rare adrenal insufficiency is relatively rare. B12, iron deficiency, CKD, depression, CLD, obstructive sleep apnea, certain viral infections, and vitamin D deficiency can also be responsible. But reasons for abnormal TSH levels on a previously stable dose. So your patient is euthyroid, all of a sudden everything goes haywire. Or if your patient requires a higher levothyroxine. I was wanting to put 10 slides on non-compliance because this is the biggest issue of all. Ensure compliance 10 times, many times over if you have to ensure this. Then patient medication, handling, storage, brand substitution. Yes, very important. Pregnancy, oral contraceptives, hormone replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy celiac disease is extremely important. Malabsorption. Or if the patient is taking these um, medications along with T4. So rather than say you wait so many hours, you tell them you take your thyroid thyroxine in the morning and you have the rest in the afternoon or evening. So that makes it a little convenient rather than, you know, sitting by the clock and trying to make out as to how many hours I need to wait before I have my next uh, even the simple iron calcium. Then if there are other medications that affect absorption, spurious medicine and i told you morbidly obese we might have a marginally elevated that was circulating in the market so even that does happen 
What about secondary hypothyroidism? A, a low normal or low TSH with low T4 and a history of pituitary disease. So I've just listed the causes and the clinical manifestations here. Just remember, all patients of secondary hypothyroidism need a referral. What about pregnancy? Yes, we have had a revision in the upper limit of the TSH with which we need to treat. So 2.5 in the first trimester, 3.0 in the second and third trimesters. And there are more recent studies in Asia, India and the Netherlands as well. But ideally, you should have your own population specific values, which unfortunately we do not have. So we are following the same criteria. And from 2011-88 to 2017, we have had a revision in the numbers which I have just given you. A very, very common question. Severe hypothyroidism in pregnancy, does it affect the child in utero? So you can see two examples, a 22-year-old primary with a TSH of 61. And a second patient, she's the 34-year um, lady, treated for secondary infertility. It's an IVF pregnancy. TSH is 42. So would you terminate? Absolutely no. You would not terminate the pregnancy. But continue it. This is extremely important. Okay, so please. This is a very, take, uh, very important take-home message here. Another woman. She's planning pregnancy, several miscarriages, Thyroid gland, <coughs> excuse me, is palpable. TSH is normal, <clears throat> but the test for thyroid antibodies is strongly positive. Here also, from the values I gave you, we want it to be less than 2.5. So TSH 3.2 may warrant treatment here, but the thyroid antibodies are strongly positive. So what would you do? You, yes, you would recommend levothyroxine starting with 25 a microgram. And these are the recommendations of the ATA guidelines. TPO antibody positive, more than 2.5 recommended. TPO antibody negative, more than 10 recommended. So these two are absolutely clear. Negative between 4 and 10, you would consider. Negative between 2.5 and 4, no. But in that particular case, I said, yes, there is a weak recommendation to treat. If there are recurrent abortions, TPO antibody is positive. You are not going to be wrong in treating that particular patient. So that will now depend from patient to patient. Is that, uh, I, I hope that is clear. So as far as pregnancy is concerned, all pregnant women with pre-existing or newly diagnosed thyroid dysfunction or a thyroid nodule, nodules should be referred to an endocrinologist. So which child needs referral? All. And I will now tell you why. Firstly, juvenile hypothyroidism. So the developmental retardation is not as severe as in cretinism, nor the features of adult myxedema. But there is severe retardation of the linear growth. Eruption of permanent teeth is delayed. Puberty, usually delayed, rarely precocious with galactoria also. Poor intellectual performance. So an intelligent or a good and normal intelligence child all of a sudden starts performing poorly in school. That may be the only history with which the parents may bring the child. Bone age is significantly retarded. So these are just typical cases of juvenile hypothyroidism. And you can see the facies in all three, which is classical. So it can be so much delayed. This is a 19-year-old boy standing next to his 17-year-old cousin. You can see there is significant retardation of growth here. Again, this is a case of juvenile hypothyroidism. You can see that his chronological age is 12. But you can barely see three carpal bones. The bone age is just three years. And believe you me, that once we start levothyroxine, within a year, all these bones, the, all the carpal bones will have come. So the bone age advances rapidly. 
And the sooner you diagnose, the better the catch-up growth. This is typical cretinism. And uh, just look at the whopping high TSH over 1000. And of course, a very, very low free T4. So th this is another example of cretinism. This is a four-year-old child who still has not ever sat up on his own. He's been in the lab. To, and these are typical. You can see the macroglossia. You can see the, the tongue almost protruding out and the typical, typical facies as well. So uh, unfortunately, they have very few or no specific signs or symptoms. The only sure way to catch it is by screening of new bones. We are already very late in that. We are way, way behind because it was initiated way back in 1963. And you can see even almost a decade back when India launched programs for child health screening, this was not included. So this is, it is really um, a very bad case scenario. It has a very strong public health relevance. However, it does not seem to be cost effective because every state has its own policy. Even if it is dictated from the center, it, would, it is up to the state to decide. So as president of the Indian Thyroid Society, I have been trying ever since I took over in March. You can see it's already six months down the line. But that, on that front, it has been a total disaster. We have not been able to make any progress in that direction. And like I said, very, very well known that we need to screen uh, children. And these are sad faces of children who were not diagnosed in time even though there are a host of clinical features. So it has to be diagnosed at birth. Right. Uh, remember the almost second or third slide in which I showed you that before, um, uh, before 1970, we did not have even levothyroxine. It was a crude uh, preparation of T4, T3. So now this is a 29-year-old woman. She is... She again gaining weight, exercise, she's tired, poor memory, work performance. She is absolutely euthyroid. What would you like to do? Continue the current dose, increase the dose, add LT3 or replace LT4 with T3. So just to answer this particular question, despite achieving euthyroidism, some patients may continue to have hypothyroid symptoms including a picture consistent with that of depression. So for this reason, a clinician following patients with TSH values, which was considered euthyroid, would likely increase the replacement dose with such complaints to return the TSH to the expected range. I've already said LT4 is what we are using. However, there is a small group of patients who do not feel well, in whom a combination of T4 with T3. So this is the answer. You can add LT3 in these individuals, and that would answer uh, that would benefit the patient, or that may benefit the patient, or rather should benefit the patient. However, please note here who should administer. If you are going to give T3 in combination with T4, the therapy must be supervised by a specialist. Okay, this is extremely important. This is this cannot be uh, used by anybody and everybody. So I hope everybody out there is not going to start prescribing T3 left, right and center whenever it is available. So I'll end up with maybe the this possibly the second last slide. So who should be referred to an endocrinologist? All children and infants, elderly individuals who have unusual constellation of thyroid function tests, patients in whom it is difficult to render and maintain a euthyroid state. I've given you examples of individuals who are unresponsive to therapy. If you're suspecting myxedema coma or secondary hypothyroidism. Goiter, nodule, or other structural changes in the thyroid gland, 
I have not even touched upon thyroid hormone resistance, presence of other endocrine diseases such as adrenal or pituitary disorders, unusual causes of hypothyroidism such as those induced by agents, pregnancy or planning pregnancy, especially in this era when a lot of women are going in for IVF because we are having pregnancies at a later and later age, anyone with cardiac disease, and if you need to add T3 to the prescription of LT4. Thank you. Thank you very much.